The Lord be with you. And I want to quickly share with you that in the month of September, just a few weeks from now, we will be in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And the church is the New Life City Church, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we're going to be there on their Wednesday night meeting, which is the 18th. And then um, we will be again on Friday uh, of that same week, which will be the 20th, and then Saturday and on Sunday. It's going to be a full weekend of teaching, and we're going to delve into the reality, the rock-bottom reality, that Christ is our life and how we actually put that into practice and, and be persons in whom Christ is our life. And the way we're approaching that, what we're doing, I have not as yet ever put that on CD and it's never been on these webinars. And so we're breaking ground and I believe that you will be mightily blessed to be there with us. So if it's possible, join us in Albuquerque, New Mexico in September, and you can get all the details uh, from the phone number 505-323-3900. And so join us there. I want to share tonight from Numbers, the book of Numbers in chapter 13, and it's the story of the 12 scouts. You remember, sometimes we, we call them spies, but they weren't spies. They were more like special ops, uh, Navy SEALs. They, they were at the top of their class. They were the leaders of the tribes of Israel, and they are sent as representatives into this land that God had promised to give them and come back with a report. Well, they did six weeks later. And in verse 32 of Numbers chapter 13, it says that they came back and they presented the report of the land that they had explored. And they said, the land that we went through to explore is a land that eats its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in its midst are men of great size. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their eyes. Okay, um, just give a quick background here. Uh, that story is obviously in the Old Testament. And what, what, is, what is God doing in the Old Testament? See, the Old Testament is not merely just a few haphazard stories of things that happened before Jesus came. Um, that something's really going on in the Old Testament. At the very beginning of the Old Testament, you have creation, and, and, and then comes Satan into that creation with the great lie. And in that lie, mankind was plunged into a, a terrible inner death. Um, a sense of separation from God, uh, a sense of his own worthlessness, and, and it came with condemnation, accusation, and also it came with a distortion of who God really is. And, and so mankind now, through the distortion of who God is, believed him to be a God who actually, well, maybe not hated them, but was in a state of perpetual annoyance. He was always irritated with mankind. So went the lie of Satan that, that God was a God that was a petty God and always ready to pounce so that you never knew if something I did was wrong and therefore God's against me and God's fighting me. And of course, in the end, if that's the case, I'm going to be punished. And, and so the God who's always accusing and the God who delights in catching me 
at doing something wrong, and the God who will punish me with great relish, well, that's the God, you see, and that's the lie of Satan. So uh, you could say that Satan's lie was a lie concerning identity. It was a lie about who God really is, and also a lie about who we really are. The lie of Satan was that you are not enough. That's in a nutshell. There's a lot more to say, but you're not enough. You're not enough. You're no good. What you ought to be, but you're not. What you should be, but you're not. You're a failure. What, 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 what you might have been, and look where you've ended up. And so it goes on. That's the great lie, because he came and said, you should be as God. You're a lot less than you could be. You're, you're in, in the light of what you should be, you're not enough. And so that was the first time mankind began to think about, am I enough? Am I enough? And, and the pressure of Satan's lies that mankind believed and he ends up believing he is not enough, and therefore he's forever cowering and hiding and apologizing and telling God how unworthy he is. And so the whole mess goes on. You might notice that at the heart of Satan's lie is religion. Religion is the nest of Satan's great lie, because it's all about who God is not and all about what you are not. That's it. And, and that's darkness, that's blindness, that's totally missing the whole point. And so the God who is love broke into that. It's a darkness that was um, man was affirming, standing against God. And so God comes in and he chooses one man, Abraham. And through Abraham and his children's children, you come to the nation of Israel. And they have a very special place. Please understand me here. Israel, the Old Testament, was not, what shall I say, uh, as I've heard it in some places, they weren't just God's pet, you know, that he's going to bless them. Well, they're Israel, of course. They're, they're favored. They're special. They're, they're going to get blessed. And why? Well, God, God just, just likes Israel. He just, he just decided to bless them. No, they were blessed. They were favored. And to them was given a revelation of the love of God that the world had never seen because of the lie of Satan. But that was not for them to say, well, see what God has done for us because we're special. It was given to them in order that it might be displayed in them, in them as persons, in them as families, in tribes, as, as a nation. They would, they would be God's display cabinet for the whole world to say, now that, look at that. And, and Israel was to come back and say, yes, we're showing you what all of us, the entire world, was uh, created to be. And so they were messengers to the world saying, look at us, look at the promises, look at the love of God, look at his blessings. He wants that for the whole world. You see, when he spoke to Abraham right at the beginning and laid out what he was going to do, he said something very significant. Many people miss it. Um, he said to Abraham that you are going to be blessed. Well, that's what I've just been talking about. But then he said, in you, Abraham, and in your descendants, Israel, all families of the earth will be blessed. Israel was not chosen just to be chosen. They were just not special. They were given these enormous gifts in order, I say again, to be the display case so that the world might begin to get it. The world might just look and say, maybe we're living a lie. If, if God is like that, if he gives that to Israel, 
then maybe, and, and it was the beginning, you say, it was the beginning of showing to the world, this, this is how much I love you, says God. Where, where do you stand in all of this? It's, what, what do you think of God? Do you believe Satan's lie, or do you believe God's announcement that he is love? See, God is not against mankind. He's, he's, he's not always finding ways in which to judge us. It isn't that you walk down the wrong street and that wasn't the will of God, so now he's going to curse your business. I heard that the other day. Um, I know I don't know what God you're worshiping, but I tell you, he comes straight out of the mouth of Satan. God is not against mankind. He is limitlessly for us. He's on our side. He loves us with a love beyond all human definition. God is love, and that love is directed, focused upon you and I. That is who God is. He is, I say, infinitely for us. Or could I dare to say this for some people? It might be a dare that God likes you. His love is not an abstract niceness lost somewhere in, in space. God's love has teeth to it. He likes you. He is infinitely loving you at the details of life. Anything else? Anything that departs what I've just said concerning his love is the lie of Satan that came into the Garden of Eden. It's the lie that blinds our minds to all that God is. And in that darkness, Satan invents, and our imagination helps him, and religion is his backer, the twisted, distorted image of God. So you see, Israel in the Old Testament, was to be the model. Would that make sense? Here, here's the model, the architect's model. God said, this, this is what I originally planned for you, and, and I'm now just showing it to you in, in the pictures, in the stories, in, in everything I say to this people, Israel. Or could I say they were the prototype of what God already knew about the whole world. Satan has blinded us, but, but God knows who we are. God knows we are his beloved. God knows that we are limitlessly enough. He made us to be the containers of his very self. His love not only desired to join himself to us, but he designed us that that might be so. You and I along with the entire world, we were designed by this God of love to be the ones in whom he would live. His purpose in creation was that he would join himself to you and I. And I say again, Israel was the beginning of telling the world that after they had crashed down into the satanic-inspired darkness. And, and so when I come to the Old Testament, and you know there are many stories there, many persons whose names, you know, come to the lips on Sunday school, and those Old Testament stories are not about unusual persons. Please don't, don't listen to me there. Well, when I read of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Gideon and Moses, they weren't unusual people. They are showing us, they are on display, of what this God created all of us to be and what he desires to be in and for every one of us. That's what it's about. You see, mankind, human, you, me, we were made. When I, when I say that, I, I'm, I'm weighing my word. Here is God, the, we say, creator, inventor, whatever. He took us 
and he fashioned us. Genesis 2 gives a very dramatic picture of God fashioning us out of the dust of the earth. And he made us. And in making us, we, we were custom made to be derived dependent creatures. That is, we are wired to receive all the very being of God who is love. We, we are wired to receive his blessing and all facets of his person to the point where God said when he made us that he made us in his image and in his likeness. And if you think about that for a moment, to be an image of God, so that when, when God would look at us, he would see himself. The only way that could be is that himself lived inside of us. And, and, and the likeness of God, that doesn't mean you've got to try and be like him. That's religion again. No, the likeness of God. Who can be like God except God? And so he said, I've made you. And it's not that you'll be all this inside of yourself to say, I did this, but rather I'm always going to be giving myself into you. And, and I in you will be the source. I will be in you the flowing out of everything you need. I'll be your love in which not only will you delight in me and with me, but you will have society that loves, and I'll be your peace, and I'll be your joy, I'll be your strength, I'll be your very life. And all you will be, I say again, a derived, you'll be receiving that. It isn't you've got to try and be like it. It says, I'll give it, and you'll receive it. And there in the Old Testament, he gave the blessings. Deuteronomy 28 is one of the major chapters. And he gives the blessings. Again, I say it was just the first streaks of, of dawn. It's the first light. It's, they're beginning to get it, understand it, that this God wants to bless them, which means to empower, enable you in all of life. Because if you read that chapter, it deals with details. I mean, it talks about going to the store. It talks about bringing the food home and cooking it. It talks about going, sitting at the dinner table, going out to work, going out to school, wherever you are. He says, I will undo you with my love presence, and I will enable you to be bigger than life. I'll enable you to do what in yourself you could never do, never be. I will cause your life to be fruitful in all the fruitage of love, and I'll cause you to be successful in all that you touch. Hmm. So, and God says, you see, I, I'm doing that in Israel to tell everybody else, everybody in the world, that's what I intend for all of you. That's interesting. Mankind, humans, you and I. Do you, do you realize what I just said there? We were not created to a poverty mindset. When God made us, it says he rested. And that's not because he was exhausted. He rested because as an artist puts down the brush, as the sculptor puts down the chisel, as the author puts down the pen and says, it's done. And there's that great sense of joy. There's a great sense of refreshment. It's done. One more brush stroke and I'd ruin the painting. One more word, and the book would be, no, no, it's done. There's nothing to add to this. There's nothing to take out of it. It's perfect. It's everything I ever dreamed it would be. It's done. It's enough. It's, you see, God rested because he had created, and then having created, said, that's it. That's exactly what I want it to be. 
And at the peak of that creation was mankind, you and I. And, and, and he looked at us and he said, that's exactly, exactly. That, in my design of creation and what I've done, you are exactly what I want you to be. You're that, that one that I love. And I love you so much, I will to live inside of you. And I've made you, I've made you a person where you're wired for that. And so I will be in you and you will always be enough, not in yourself, because you're made to receive. And so you, a real, full human being, will be you and me, united together. And in that, you will know success in being human. That is what human is all about, a creature in whom God lives and reveals himself. And in that is peace beyond words. It is joy. It is laughter. It is the embrace of God's love. I say, we weren't created to be poverty mindset, that I'm not enough. I can't do that. I never will be able to do that. I don't have enough. No, he, he says, you will have true wealth. And of course, true wealth isn't money. I think you should know that by now. True wealth is, is, true wealth is to know that you are loved. People who are millionaires would give their millions to know that. What? True wealth is peace. That's why people get money. They say, it gives me peace of mind. Yeah, right. It sure doesn't. It gives them enough money to buy all the pills that they need. <clears throat> True wealth is joy. Joy. And I could keep going. You, you see what I'm saying. Uh, it's, it's all only in God I can discover this true wealth where I don't live anymore from deficit, but from the wealth of God and God living in us from the very beginning of creation was to be God the Son, the one we know as Jesus, the Lord, the Christ. And, and, and that, I say again, that began to be shown in Israel in the Old Testament. It, it was ju just, it was almost the nursery. It was teaching the people like an ABC of life. Uh, and they're just beginning uh, and the lie is, is, is sometimes being, you know, wavers because they're beginning to see it. Okay, that's a long introduction. Here's Israel, the people I've just been talking about. And, you know, they had been taken out of Egypt. They'd been slaves in Egypt for 450 years. That's long enough to see yourself, your personal identity as a slave. I think you, you, nobody there ever remembered a day when that wasn't true. And they don't remember any of their grandparents ever saying anything other than it was always like this. They were slaves under a wicked, cruel dictator, Pharaoh. And there had come the, the wonders. We call them the plagues that came. God came to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And the rest, you know, 10 plagues and the people are gone. The Red Sea opens uh, and they, they go to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, there begins this, well, I don't know, incredible, I suppose, is a word we could use. God, God sits and has a conversation with these people. And he tells them just what not what he just merely thinks about them. He tells them what he knows about them. Please understand this, that the most important thing I can ever know is what God knows about me that the lie had tried to take away. And so God now tells these slaves, for in their mind they're still slaves, even though they're fantastically free. But, but in their mind, they're still slaves. And he tells them, this is the people I know you to be. This is the people I designed, I created. This is who you really are. And it tell, you can read it in Exodus 19. 
Let me quickly read it to you. You yourselves, says the Lord, have seen what I did to Egypt. That is, you, you, you saw the plagues. How I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. It's a marvelous picture. He said, I, I'm, I'm like a great mother eagle, and, and you're my little chicks, and, and I put you on my back, and I, I, I carried you out of Egypt, and I brought you here. Hmm. Now he says, if you obey me fully, keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. He says, you will be my special treasure. And, and, and weigh the words. He, th this God is, is talking to us humans, in, in, though we're, we're overhearing it with Israel in terms of they were the prototype, but he's saying, I treasure you. You're not just creatures that I made. No, you're my treasure. You're my special treasure. And he says, the, the whole world is mine, but you're my, my special, my treasure. You will be for me a kingdom of priests, which in plain English means you will have an open heaven. You and I will fellowship, we'll dance together, we'll talk together. You'll be my friends. And you'll be a holy nation. And holy does not mean dressing in black and looking miserable. Holy means whole. It, it means you are separated to me who is life. He said that to them. Now, now think about it. I brought you on eagle's wings. I care for you. You are important to me. I didn't leave you in Egypt. I brought you out. And in bringing you out, you mean everything to me. You are my treasure. And I'm making you can freely access my presence. You and I will live together. And I'll make you whole persons in the light of love. I say it again, the most important thing. Okay, put it this way. The most important thing is not what you know about God. It is to have our eyes open to know what he knows about you and what he believes and sees about you. Do you get that? See, I know I'm talking to some who have been to Bible school and you came away with whatever you came away with, but essentially it, it said that now you know about God. Well, quite frankly, uh, even though I have a Bible school um, and we have students, but if, if my students leave that school at the end and all they can say is that they've now, they know about God, then they are of all people most miserable religionists. You see, that, to know about God, that's abstract. That's just God. No, and you now you can pass a test, right? Yeah, true and false about God. Fantastic. No, the most, when it says in the scripture that you might be filled with the knowledge of God, that's the great prayers of the New Testament, that you might have the, revealed the knowledge of God. That doesn't mean that you study about God. It means that your eyes will be opened to see what he says about you, what he knows about you. And, and when I discover what he knows about me, and believes about me. That is, God says, this is the truth about you. That leaves me speechless and, and, and causes me to respond to him and realize he loves me and, and he has made me and is to me more than words can ever tell. And that's what happened there in Exodus 19. He is revealing to this is who you are. Because I say they saw themselves as unimportant. We're slaves. At the sight of anyone that looks important, we try to hide. We cower before people. Oh, oh we're glad to be free of Pharaoh. And I guess now we're sort of on the run. We're fugitive slaves. Uh, but we're free, aren't we? We are free. Pinch yourself. We're free. Oh, come on. God saw them as infinitely more than runaway slaves. He's just said it. He says, 
You're my people. You're the people I treasure. You are the people I embraced you and I carried you. And I've made you a, a, a nation of priests, that is, people who can talk to me face to face. You're not slaves. That's, that's gone. In fact, in my eyes, you never were slaves. You were always my sons and daughters that had been kidnapped, but you, you never were slaves, though you might have been in slavery. This announcement that he made is shocking. Can I take it in? Any more than many people today who have been born in the slavery of religion, they can't take it in. I, I'm serious. I am very serious that when I, I tell people the love of God toward them, they are offended, they are shocked, they're frightened. They're terrified of what their pastor might say if he found them believing this stuff. Isn't it amazing? And, and the, this uh, message of God's love to this people was revolutionary in the world of the religion of that day because all the gods, time doesn't change, but the names of the gods change, um, but re religion is religion. Uh, and the, in that world in which this takes place, the gods were cruel. They were destructive. They sure didn't like us. And so here is a God revealing his love to this people which I say again was putting on show his love for the whole world. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't see them as slaves. No, you're my children. You're my children. I've just rescued you from the kidnapper. But well, because they put you in slavery, it didn't change that you were my sons and daughters and I love you. That's why I came to get you. He doesn't know them as slaves cowering before harsh masters. He knows them as those that he created them, the design that, that you are receivers. You, you are deriving God's life and love and strength and ability so that you are stronger and greater than all the opposition. In fact, you because I'm dwelling in the midst of you, you are you're a community of God possible inside creation. That took place just really a few weeks, might extend it into a month or two, but it, it was very recently. They, they had had that incredible conversation with God at Mount Sinai. And now they're going to the land that God promised to give them 450 years ago. And here they are. They've come to the border. And still ringing in their ears is they are beloved of God. They're special. They're his treasure. And he blesses them. And he inside of them is their strength. They come and they're on the border of the land of promise. And that's when it happens. Each tribe takes a, a leader and, and appoints them to go to the land. And what, what we, they were saying, in effect, represent us, you see. We can't all go, not right now. But we, we, need to, we need to map it out. We need to know what this land looks like and how we're going to go about taking it. And, and so you, for 12 of you, one for each tribe, represent us in this place of God's promise. Go, go there. Be our ears and eyes. Come back and tell us what it holds for us. Boy, I, I envy you. You'll be the first ones to tread on the land of promise. Land of promise. You know it as Canaan. But if you read through, especially Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is a great book. And in the book of Deuteronomy, God continually refers to the land of Canaan, his gift to this people, as his rest. 
and that they will go to their rest. See, that, that goes back to what I was talking about a minute ago. The rest of God, where he is satisfied with all creation. He can't add to it or subtract. It's as perfect as the mind of God could make it. And mankind, he rested. Let, let, me, let me say it again quickly. When he made you, he stood back and said, this you is perfect. A person that I have wired to be absolutely enough in terms of me, in terms of actually Christ living inside of you in a perfect union. Not, not just someone sort of like water in a tub. No, the, he says God is going to live inside of you and, and relate to you. And, and, and so all that I am will be in you and all that you are in me and we will live in this union. I made you like that. And that's what a human really is. And I'm satisfied. I come to rest. I'm proud of my own work. You work. This is it. There's not, nothing to be at. You're not a work in progress. It's not that I'll come back in a little bit and say, you're not enough. We've got to do some more. No, you're complete. That's my favorite word, he said. No, you're complete. It's finished. So I, I look, have you ever looked at yourself and realized that this yourself this body, this mind, your imagination, that, that core of yourself, that invisible you that is all through your cells of your body. You, you, you are fitted. You are actually wired to be the habitation of God. And that's what a real human is, you see. That's the original design. To live in this dynamic union with God so that you image him to the world. That, that's, that's how we were created. It's who you are. And, and it's a simultaneous union. You know what I mean? It isn't that God sort of over here a bit and, and when you need something, you have to scream at him or cry. Where you are, he is. Where he is, you are simultaneous. For me to live is Christ. That's what it's about. See, It's seamless. Huh. And so that's God's rest. And now he calls this land his rest and the rest, the rest of these people. Why? Well, I rest in God's rest when I agree with him and celebrate that, yeah, I, I am this wonderful creature that is made to be the receptacle of God, <clears throat> that he may abide in me and I abide in him. I agree that's who I am. That's God's purpose. That's his plan. And, and so I celebrate myself as one united with God deriving my life and being from him. Well, going into Canaan would be the perfect opportunity, you see, to rest in God and in his opinion of them. Do, do, you, do you follow me? Canaan, no human being could just walk in there and take it. Uh, I mean, the, the scouts were right in what they'd seen. They said the these people are gigantic. They're, they're bad news. And, and we just don't have it. We don't have it to, to go in there and take it. Um, right. That, and I can almost hear the laugh of God. That's it. That's it. You see, it, it's impossible for you to... This is a dead end for you. So it's the perfect opportunity for you to rest and say, but it isn't in who I am, it's who he is in me. 
My strength is not something that I conjure up with positive statements. It is that God himself who loves me is the strength in me to go and take what he's giving to me. And so therefore, you this will be the opportunity just to enter into his rest and to realize I'm complete in him to meet any opposition, any contradiction. Do you get it? Well, the 12 scouts went into the land. <clears throat> they went for six weeks, end to end, scattered out, came back together, compared notes, and they all came back with the same look on their face. Well, not quite, 10 of them did. A and they'd seen the opposition. A and they, they, we read, well, they, they said, that, you know, wherever we went, these were big people. The Hebrew people were not big. And so when you looked at these people, I tell you, those of you that know the Old Testament, do you remember Goliath? That, that monstrous person that David went out and, and killed? Do you remember him? Well, he was one of these, or at least his ancestors had been there. It, they, they, were, they were a race of people that were unusually large. And that, yes, they were unusually large, but there are people in the world today, tribes in Africa, that are as big as that. They, don't, don't get Jack and the Beanstalk idea. They, but they, they were big, very big. Their weaponry was as big to meet the, the size of their persons as were their cities. And, and the, the, the walls of the cities, they, they were powerful. And maybe the most terrifying thing was they were demonized. And as you approached their city, you saw the most hideous um, exhibit of their worship of demons. And that was the reason that the land was being handed over to Israel, because their presence was now such a terrible force in the world of destruction that they had to be removed. And, and, and so here they, these, these little chaps, Israel, and they look at these big people uh, and they look even bigger when you get up against them and, and see their power and, and then to cower and cringe before the sight of their demonic worship and sacrifice. And 10, 10 of those scouts went into panic mode. I, I think, you know, <laughs> um, it, it's not out of sight that they would do that. Um, or all that they'd heard, and I, I say again, just only a few weeks before concerning God's love, his promises, his empowering blessing to them, and that they were on the display case to the whole world to see what God was really like. All of that, all of that, the excitement of coming into the land and representing their people, the whole jolly lot evaporated. And they're looking at each other with sort of greenish face. I mean, if we are to face this opposition, uh, then all that talk about a, original design and me being enough to handle anything and God living inside of us, uh, that design needs an upgrade. We are not enough. We can't face these characters. We're not enough. We are not able, please. We can't face these monsters. I, I mean, walking in this land is like walking through a sea of alligators. It, it, it eats us as we're, we're going through. This problem that we're facing is greater than all God's promises. Forget the promises. Forget God. Forget the whole jolly idea. They are gripped in fear, panic. And to mask their fear, they blame God. And then, of course, Moses for bringing them to this place. 
that they're, they're basically saying God lied, you see. He said this was his gift to us. What's he giving to us? A night in the lion cage? I mean, you call this the gift of God? What kind of a God is he? I'll tell you what, he's just like all the other gods. I thought he was different. I mean, he, he said he loved us and brought us here. Well, what, brought us here? To be fed like meat to these monsters? He brought us, this is it, he brought us here to kill us. That's it. The, the whole thing is a trap. It's a setup. He brought us out of Egypt because he's that sadistic monster god that wants to bring us out here and watch us die one by one by these monsters. It's a trap. That was their conversation. Well, what's going on? What goes on in many a person, and probably some who are now listening, what do they do? They are focusing on the problem. D don't, don't just say, well, of course. No, think about it. What, what you have heard in terms of the gospel, that Jesus, Messiah, Christ, who is, he's here in the Old Testament, but he now actually becomes one of us. And he carries the whole of the lie system and the darkness that had wrapped around and in us to death by the shedding of his blood. And he rose out of death, having delivered you, not from Egypt, something far worse, from the liar himself, and has cleansed you from sin and announces, now we can go back to the original design and I will live in you. And when you face life, I face life and your needs are swallowed up in my supply. In me, all of the am not, cannot, will not has all been crucified. And now you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That, that's where we're at. We're at the other end of this when it all comes to fulfillment. And yet still I find people who focus on the problem. And it's amazing, one thought can really evaporate everything I thought we believed. Um, just you, you open an email and that's it. it you're finished for the day. And, and, and your, your body goes into awful anxiety and, and terror. And, and everything that you were singing about on Sunday, you forgot all about that. You're focusing now only on the problem. That's it, only on the problem. Your thoughts are racing. Your imagination is producing movies by the minute uh, of doom and it's all over, it's finished. And it comes out of your mouth with words that, that prophesy the doom of all. You know what I mean. See, when we focus, we magnify. Have you noticed that? You focus on the problem, the problem magnifies. You focus on God and the Bible says magnify the Lord. That isn't to make him bigger, it's to see how big he really is. And as they focused on the problem, what happened and always happens, as you focus on the problem, it magnifies. The whole thing looked much bigger, it exaggerated it but also it diminished them. That's what always happens. You focus on the problem, it appears bigger, and you see yourself as smaller. It was as if the more they talked about the problem, they're shrinking, they're shrinking, they're shrinking. That's the way of fear. It exaggerates the problem. It diminishes the promises of God. And it diminishes you to be nothing that God created you to be. And so rejecting the rest of God, they defaulted 
to Egyptian slave thinking, Egyptian mind, Egyptian identity. We're no good, we're worthless, we're slaves, we can't do this, we're not enough. And that involved their imagination as it always does. And so, and in their vivid imagination, they said, we are, as, uh, and it says, we looked at ourselves in our own sight. That is, we are looking at ourselves and we are now pronouncing who we are. We're grasshoppers. We're insects before these monsters. And as always is the case, they assumed how they saw themselves is how the rest of the world saw them. You know that's true. You see yourself as worthless and you expect and assume the whole world sees you the same way. Inferior, a grasshopper. I don't know, some of you city folk, you might not have been around many grasshoppers. We, we have them here by the thousand and walk out into our pasture on the ranch and they're flying through the air all around you. Cute little creatures. Often they land on you by accident. And honestly, I swear, they look up at you and say, I'm terribly sorry. It's, uh, they're, they're inferior, insignificant, I mean. Uh, are you going to say, well, I'm not going down there? No, 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 until you've taken all the grasshoppers out. No, no, they're insignificant. They're without consequence. And when these 12 of these 10 men looked at themselves, they said, that's who we are. That's who we are. We're slaves, you see. We're slaves. We ought not to be here. We're, we're inferior. We're insignificant. Do you think those giants give a second thought about us? We're without consequence. We're <laughs> worthless creatures. That's who we are. I, I'm sure. I am sure. Because we know that's how the giants are looking at us. They're not even bothering with us, good grief. I, I, I'm sure in the taverns at night, that's the joke of the night, that those insects out there are trying to take over the land. That was their thinking. I mean, if, if we get it out of here alive, certainly if we come back, we'll be crushed under their boots without even being noticed. How many grasshoppers do you kill just by walking through the pasture? You didn't intend to, you just... They were there, you trowel on them. God gave us this land? You've got to be kidding. We're trespassers here. We should apologize to the giants for being here. And have you noticed the way you see yourself gives you permission to be what you see yourself to be? Boy, I'd like another half an hour on that one. The way you see yourself the way you imagine yourself to be gives you permission. It, it goes through your body like a, an okayness. Yeah, you, you have permission to be that. And, and that's why you're convinced everybody else sees you the same way. And so they have given themselves permission to be crawling insects. Okay, that's how they saw themselves. That's how they saw themselves. They had forgotten how God sees them. And if you can hear me, while they are seeing themselves as insignificant grasshoppers, God still sees them as his delighted children, the ones that he designed, made, fashioned, wired to be his dwelling and the place of his fellowship and friendship. He hasn't blinked. He doesn't, he doesn't get messed up with all the stupid imagination of how we see ourselves. He sees us according to truth. And they come back together and they're, they're almost home now. Almost home. And they've got to go back and give a report. And so they get together and say, OK, what are we going to say? Well, they said what we've been talking about, you see. And of course, we feel good. There's 10 of us, and the majority is always right, isn't it? You know, <laughs> They fueled each other's fear. They decided it would be better to go back to Egypt. You know, it was, 
it was kind of homey there, wasn't it? I mean, all that slavery, at least we knew what was happening. And the food was good, wasn't it? All that garlic soup. Yeah. And that's what they decided. God can keep his gift. And all that nonsense about us being his containers and enough, his treasure in earthen vessels, forget that. Life is better in Egypt. And, and of course, we don't go back and tell the people we were cowards and then face the people. I tell you what, the reason we're saying all this is for our children. See, we're, we're concerned about the children. So, But if we stay here or advance in this place, we're all dead. And the only two that disagreed were Caleb Caleb and Joshua, because they are another story, and we'll look at them maybe next week. But, you know, this is an amazing fact. These men, especially these men, because they had been leaders of the tribes, they had had front row seats to see continual miracles in Egypt. We read about the ten plagues, and that's hair-raising enough. These ten men had been there, and they had actually seen God's hand carefully dismantle all the gods of Egypt in terms of the plagues. For every plague was um, a god that the Egyptians worshipped, now defunct. These ten men had seen that happen. The, can you get this? These ten men had actually felt the mud under their feet as they walked through the Red Sea that parted to let them do so. These ten men had walked in the shadow of the cloud of God's glory presence. They had looked at night and see it like a fire above them and in the midst that kept them warm in the terrible cold of the desert night. Do you realize they had... Well, just a minute. The last meal that they had before coming into this land of Canaan was manna. And you know manna was that miracle food that God fed the people with every morning. And that, that had been their last meal before they came here. And the water from the rock. And they could all remember when Joshua had led the people against Amalek, when Amalek had tried to kill them in their journey through the desert. And they had wandered before this incredible God. They had applauded him and worshipped him. And it's all fantastic. And they danced on the shores of the Red Sea that God had delivered them. And now those men are saying this and saying that God's promises, they're not enough and we can't do this and we've got to get out of here and go back to Egypt. Look, let me say this. Living in the middle of miracles is not the mark of the rest of faith. For I know too many people just like this they have seen miracles. They have seen the hand of God. But when it comes to resting in the reality that Christ is your life and facing life from Him to display Him, oh no, no, they, they flee from that and they want to see another miracle. No, let's, let's get it straight because we've got it very unstraight. Miracles are wondrous. I believe in signs and wonders. I lay hands on the sick. I expect miracles. Yes, I do. But I'd never say that that is the mark of a person resting in faith. And this story proves it. You see, unbelief is to choose to believe the lie about who I am. Unbelief. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. They chose unbelief. That is, they refused to believe that they were the enough 
that God said they were. They refused to believe that they were to be the containers and the expressors of God, and that was enough to face everything and to live life to the full. They wouldn't believe that. They believed the lie of who they were. Therefore, they lived out of sync with their own original design and the God that made them that way. Hmm. And so here they are. I mean, can you see it? They are custom made to be the receptors of the glory of God. But they refuse to believe it. And so they're going back and they're giving this report to the people. You see, faith is not something you get. I'm going to talk more about this next week. I'm about to close and bring this up. But faith is not something you get. Faith is not something you work toward. That is, when I have enough faith, you know, we're working at it. We've got to get faith, get faith, get faith. And how do you get faith? I've got all these formulas of how to get faith. No, 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 no. Faith isn't something we get. All through the scripture says faith is the gift of God. No, we do not walk to work toward having enough faith to take his promise. Rather, he reveals himself to us and that revelation ignites faith within us. When I see what he's like, faith rises and says, yes, the revelation had been given. But these people had just, well, it was dogma, religious stuff. You say, yes, 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 amen, amen. But you don't get it. You don't see it. And therefore, although they could repeat everything God said at Sinai, they had not taken the revelation of his love. And therefore, this is what, there's no faith there, no faith. Faith was not ignited. Instead of believing they were the people God knew them to be, saw them to be, they thought that they had to themselves try and be what they're supposed to be. Which, of course, is ridiculous, because then they're trying to be who, in fact, they already were, if only they believed it. They were occupied with the problem instead of occupied with God, who's ready to reveal himself in and through them here and now. And so the ten gave their report. The whole nation believed them and went into panic mode. And that nation wandered for 40 years in the desert. <laughs> Do you realize after they gave their report, the next morning they had the audacity to go and pick up the manna of God's provision and have breakfast on manna while they were planning to walk out on God. Isn't that fantastic? And for 40 years they lived on miracle manna. They drank from the water out of the rock and God protected them and healed them. But they would not simply believe who they were and let God be who he is in them. Amazing. They believed what they saw in themselves rather than believe what God saw in them and knew them to be. There's one last thing. I have to throw this in. <laughs> it is 40 years later. They're back. Only now it's their children. You know the ones they made the excuse for not going in. But now those children, they are the nation that is going to go in. And this time Joshua, who was one of those scouts, now is the leader. He took Moses' place and he sends in two. That's a wise move. Don't send in 12. He sent in two. And they came to Jericho, you remember, and they went into Rahab's house. And when they came searching for them, Rahab hid them up on the roof underneath stuff. And then she came up to them. Joshua 2.8. It says, now before they lay down, it's nightfall and they're going to sleep up there on the roof. 
she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, okay, she's talking now to the two scouts, 40 years after what we've just been talking about. And this is what she said. She's a Canaanite, see? She's, she's a Canaanite. They're inside Canaan. They're staying in the house in Jericho. And so this Canaanite woman, a daughter of the giants, you say, and she comes, she's hid them from, from the authorities that were looking for them, and, and she comes, and she sits down before them, and this is what she says. She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land. What? Huh? This is what? You said, what? Oh, yeah. She said, I know the Lord has given you the land. In fact, everybody does. She said, and that the terror of you has fallen on us. And that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. What? You mean we, 40 years ago, ran for our lives from people who were terrified of us? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Why? What happened? Why, she said, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And when we heard it, our hearts melted and had no courage remained in any man any longer, all because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Well, what do you know? Do I have to preach on this? You know, I mean, they looked at themselves and they said, we're grasshoppers. We're no good. We're worthless because we know, we know who we are. God doesn't. We know who we are. And we know that those big guys out there, they look at us as grasshoppers. We're finished. We're done. It's over. We can't do this. And this woman says, at that time, at the, those men out there were terrified of you. Their hearts had melted for fear because they knew how great your God was and that he was in you. And they were already preparing the white flag of surrender. And you quit and ran to the desert. Please, would you take that to heart? I'm going to start right there next week. But would you take it to heart? Your problem that looks so big is actually terrified of you because the problem knows who you really are. Isn't it amazing? Our enemies know how God knows you has known you to be always. And the only people in the equation sometimes that don't know who they are is us. We are the lords of the earth. We are the ones in whom the glory of God is seen. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He dwells within us. We are the apple of his eye. We are his treasure. He's beloved. Rise up and be who you are. Look not into the mirror of yourself, but look into the eyes of God and let him tell you who you are. Well, there it is. And now the blessing of God who is almighty love, the eagle who carries you on his wings, he bless you, bless you every day of this week. Bless you in your innermost being. Bless you in your mind and imagination. Bless you with joy and with peace that out of you shall flow rivers of life into your situation. So I bless you because that's who you are in Christ. And that's the way it is.